here because uh, I work for Google, but uh, it's important to note that um, I don't represent Google, actually. Uh, this is going to be uh, a little bit awkward, uh, but because it does say Google on the slide, I realize. Uh, but the, the enterprise sales team who sponsors the conference just generously agreed to share their time uh, with me. Uh, so of course I said yes, because this is a great audience that I would, I would love to have the chance to talk to for a few minutes, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, technology, uh, mostly. Uh, I have a couple of notes here, and we have a little handout I'll talk about in a second. Uh, I am not from this world. Uh, I have a, a little bit of a, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> I, I still couldn't get what everybody said. What world am I from? OK. Uh, I'm from an, the People's Republic of California. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's a little different, uh, the technology industry out there. Has anybody seen the HBO show, Silicon Valley? Few people? OK. So if I asked that question on my home planet, everybody would be watching it, uh, mostly so they could complain about how it's got everything wrong, but everybody would be watching it. Um, so so I'm not from, I don't have decades of experience in healthcare policy. I am not expert in even the Affordable Care Act, even though that's what I went to work on. Um, you guys are, I realize that. Um, the thing that I know about is how to uh, make, uh, make, is how to make uh, big distributed systems work, uh, technically. How to make things like a, hypothetically, a website for uh, federal healthcare enrollment work. Uh, so that's what I was asked to go do, and that's what I did do. I'm going to take advantage of my status as not part of your tribe a little bit, uh, by which I'm going to say a bunch of things that is, uh, is just observations that I have uh, as an outsider from the technology industry. Uh, and if I hurt anybody's feelings, which is very likely, uh, or if uh, you hate everything that I have to say, you don't have to listen, because I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not part of the, I'm not part of the group. Uh, so anyway. Um, with, uh, with that preface, uh, I figured, so, uh, so they suggested that I talk about a little bit about uh, lessons learned from healthcare.gov, basically, um, which is a topic that I've been known to talk about for two hours and then go over the two-hour time limit. So I'm going to try to do it in uh, 15 more minutes, approximately. Uh, and obviously, I can only uh, boil it down to a few very high-level points in order to do that. Um, so. Uh, it's, it, a lot about the story doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. Um, if you want to know how uh, I actually got involved, uh, there's a whole exciting story. Um, a couple of people mentioned the, the Time article yesterday. There is a Time article about it uh, if you want to read it, so I'm going to skip that part of the story. Just, uh, just take my word for it that me and four other uh, guys, uh, they did happen to be all guys, were asked uh, in the third week of October uh, by, uh, by Todd Park, who I heard mentioned, so apparently people know who that is, uh, and, and uh, 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 OSTP uh, and Dennis McDonough from the White House uh, asked us to come and do an assessment for a couple of days because they were starting to get the idea that maybe this website was uh, going to be a problem. Uh, this was like the third week of October. Uh, and uh, if you remember, the federal government was shut down for the first two weeks of October, so that kind of interfered with their ability to do anything uh, for a while. So they just started to worry about it late in October. They asked us to come out there, and they said, uh, basically they said, they gave us a sales pitch, which was something like this. We need you to come out uh, and do an assessment uh, of, the affor of this healthcare.gov. It's the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, as you already know. Uh, and uh, if we can't get this website to it, this is, I'm paraphrasing what other people said. Uh, if, if we can't get this website to work, if we can't get this enrollment period, we can't get at least let's say four million or so people enrolled in this first enrollment period, then there's going to be no other options for us but to delay the implementation for another year, as in de delay the, uh, the time that the individual mandate takes effect for another year. If we do that, this will very obviously be a disastrous issue for us in the upcoming midterm in 2014. Uh, you can, seems, seems, seems all but uh, unavoidable that we'll lose uh, you know, the, the House and the Senate. Uh, and this Congress has already spent its last, con its last session voting to repeal the Act 40-something times. Uh, you can guess what they'll do in the next session. Uh, the President will be basically lame duck two years early. It'll be a complete disaster. His administration will end in ruins, uh, and nobody will attempt health care reform for another generation. Uh, that's what they said. Uh, you're right. So, uh, and then they're like, but we really, want, we really want your honest opinion of whether this can be fixed within like, the next couple of months. <coughs> So we're like, uh, okay. 
that never seemed like we really had much of an option other than to try to fix what we had. Uh, there was no way you could start over and rewrite things starting in the third week of October, for example. So it seemed like we never really had any chance other than to fix what we had. So we went in expecting that to be the case, expecting that nobody, honestly, nobody anywhere thought there was very much chance of success at this point uh, late in October. Uh, we figured that we would give it our best shot uh, and go home a few weeks later and disappear back into the shadows and never be heard from again uh, was what we expected uh, with when we went to lunch in those early days in October, November. So we, we got in there. Uh, so we were brought in technically as subcontractors of one of the companies working on uh, healthcare.gov because uh, as it turns out, you can't volunteer for the federal government. There's a whole law involved. It gets complicated, whatever, whatever, whatever. So we, got, uh, we were actually uh, employees, uh, but we had... This is an important point that I'll come back to. Um, we had no authority to tell anybody to do anything whatsoever, uh, any more than I have any authority to make you listen to me right now, which I don't at all. Uh, you don't have to listen to me right now. There's not a thing I could do about it. Uh, it's not my conference. You know, it's not. You, you were under no obligation. Neither were the. Neither were any of the companies. Uh, neither was. Uh, uh, I'm not supposed to name companies. I get in trouble for that. Uh, neither were any of the companies working on uh, healthcare.gov. Uh, we were just subcontractors, hourly subcontractors, just like everybody else. Uh, there's no reason anybody had to listen to us, but that's how we went in. We went in and started looking around, and I figured I would... Here, so here was the plan for today. Uh, um, so I've been listening for the last uh, day and a half or so, uh, partly because I didn't know anything about you, and I don't know anything about your audience, about this audience. I don't know what kinds of things you're interested in, not interested in, so I tried to get a little bit of a clue before I just uh, started you know, running my mouth. Uh, and uh, best as I can tell, you guys are fighting the ground war, is what it would look like to us from, uh, from, uh, from Fed land. Um, you are doing the retail uh, implementation of, like we talked, we heard a lot of presentations about, uh, um, you know, San Diego County uh, relationships with the hospitals and the community networks, and like you see actual real patients. In Fed land, you never see an actual real patient. That never happened, certainly, while I was working on healthcare.gov. Uh, and one thing that I've already learned just by listening to you for the last couple of days is that you need better air cover to fight this ground war. I heard a couple, I, I, I don't know if you, a couple of people maybe agree with this, but I heard a couple of questions yesterday along the lines of, uh, can we get some kind of like policy statement? Can we get some kind of leadership, whatever? That's a thing I'll come back to as well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in the end here. Uh, but anyway, being that that's my understanding of, uh, of what you do and what you're about, I figured I had a plan for what I'd say today. I wanted to leave everybody with something that you can actually use, and that's why there's these handouts on the tables in front of you, because I figured every single, well, let's do this experiment right now, live, and see whether I get embarrassed. How many people are, are part of the implementation of any kind of IT or technology project in your agency, organization, whatever? Okay, good. So almost everybody. That's what I figured. Uh, and I'll bet that if I rephrase the question to be how many of you are affected by a, a IT project that's being implemented in your agency, organization, or whatever, probably that's everybody. So uh, no matter what your relationship to that project, no matter whether you have any authority over that project or not, no matter whether you feel like you have any authority or not, here are the, th the handout of some things that you can do uh, to just find out for yourself, if nothing else, whether this project has any hope of success or not. Uh, and unfortunately, with government IT projects, sometimes the answer is not. So, um, having distracted everybody with the handouts, which everybody's reading now, um, if you want to listen for just another minute, I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, maybe I should have thought this through a little better. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, so, but I will come back to that in just a second. Um, so, let me tell you just really quickly what were the big things that we found wrong with healthcare.gov. Um, First thing that we found that was that was a huge obstacle to success was that the organization and the system that they built were both ridiculously fragmented and depended on dozens of vendors and dozens of products, all of which were supposed to be working together. Uh, and this is a, there's a thing in software engineering called uh, Conway's law. I don't do you know what I'm talking about? Um, it's a it's it's it wasn't. <laughs> It's a thing somebody said like back in the 60s that wasn't intended as a joke, but is usually invoked as a joke today. Uh, it's, the, it's the observation that big, complicated organizations are only capable of producing software systems which mirror that organization. 
Uh, and that's exactly, this was a textbook case is what we had here. There were like, the press has reported 55 different vendors, different contractors involved. Uh, I didn't, I never bothered to try to validate that number, but I know that on a day-to-day -day basis, we interacted with at least 20 different companies uh, to work on one website. Uh, that's not, that's not, that's not how the technology industry does things anyway. So problem one, incredibly fragmented plan, incredibly fragmented design, way too many people at the table uh, that were supposed to be involved in the implementation, way too many. Um, problem two, there was no monitoring uh, and uh, this is a thing that if you don't, if you don't work on large websites kind of maybe doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, by way of analogy, um, I assume not an expert. I assume that there's a reason that every bed in the ICU has the vital statistics monitor next to it uh, that says, you know, heartbeat, breathing, stuff like that. Um, there are equivalent systems for websites and for any piece of technology that just tells you on a dashboard, is the thing up? Is it working right now? Is anybody getting through the website? Those are pretty important if you want to have a working system over any period of time, uh, and none of them existed. Uh, that, none of that was built uh, for healthcare.gov. So we literally did not know. Anybody who says that they know how much healthcare.gov was up in the first three weeks of October is lying because nobody knew. Uh, there, was no, there was no monitoring. There was uh, literally uh, no way to find out. Uh, once we, we installed some stuff very quickly, we gathered the first week of complete data, we found out that the uptime in that first complete week was 43%, uh, which uh, uh, if this were a technical audience, you would all be gasping in disbelief. Uh, that is unbelievably poor. Um, like a, even a website which is not doing very well, even kind of a crappy website like my bank's website or something is probably up at least 90 or 95% of the time. <laughs> So like 43% is like unbelievably bad. Uh, problem three with healthcare.gov, um, the, uh, the companies that, that we hired to implement healthcare.gov have not built this kind of system before. Uh, they come from a different, uh, they come from a different, a whole different worldview, uh, which is basically uh, to us, to, uh, to engineers from the outside, from the tech industry, um, it's very much corp IT kind of mindset and focus, which is a different way of doing things. Uh, and they just didn't have the experience that they needed building big, highly available things where everybody's going to notice if it's down. Uh, I mean, even in, even in our world, like, it's, <laughs> we don't have any products that CNN is going to, like, run the entire, like, if, if, like, Google Talk or something goes down, like, that's not going to be the top story on CNN all day tomorrow. Uh, in the case of healthcare.gov, it was literally for this entire month of October. Every day we went to lunch, we saw our own problems uh, on CNN. Uh, before, we, before we had any monitoring, that was the only way we knew whether there was a, <laughs> there was a problem. <laughs> uh, so it was effective at that. Uh, that's not, I don't recommend it. There are better ways. Uh, and then the last problem with healthcare.gov uh, is that, uh, um, like I said, I tried to boil these down into a couple sentences, even though I usually spend like a half hour on each one. It's not, uh, the work, the environment is not one that is optimized to get good work out of engineers. Uh, now, uh, if you, so I promised I would talk about uh, the little thing I passed out. So a bunch of the questions on here, like what are the engineers wearing, like what's on their desk, stuff like that. I know they sound superficial and they are giving, and they are making it sound like engineers are kind of prima donnas to work with. Uh, that's because good engineers are kind of prima donnas to work with. Uh, that's, that's just a fact. Um, they, uh, especially, as, you know, some people, th there's, kind of, uh, there's kind of two axes. There's how full of themselves somebody is and there's how competent they are and these are not necessarily correlated in any way. Uh, but just uh, even amongst the really good, effective engineers that you want, uh, some of them are going to be full of themselves and some of them are not. Some of them are going to be willing to put on a shirt and tie in order to work on this mission. Some of them are not. Uh, you don't have to think this is a good thing. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to think that the engineers are the creative snowflakes and rock stars that they think they are. You don't have to agree with any of that. I'm just telling you that's how they think of themselves. Uh, and, uh, and if you want access to more of them, you know, finding a way to deal with that uh, helps a lot. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so a lot of the stuff here, like, you know, they, 
It's not that putting on a shirt and tie is actually going to somehow materially interfere with my ability to like write code. It doesn't, obviously. You can operate the keyboard wearing a shirt and tie. But uh, when you're trying to sell this job to, uh, to people who have their choice of any number of attractive jobs, like Facebook, Google, uh, whatever, uh, they're going to see something like that, as superficial as it is, they're going to see something like that as probably representative of how you're going to treat them forever uh, about everything at the company. Uh, and, if, and if this is the kind of place that that's more important to them than whether I'm good at doing my job, then I'm probably just going to look elsewhere. Uh, and that's, 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 that's what I mean by some of the like, superficial questions on the checklist here. Uh, so um, the environment, the culture that, the culture that uh, has been successful at building successful technology, like the culture that built Twitter, the culture that built uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, the Facebook, Amazon, all these things, is very, very different uh, from what happens inside the government agency. Uh, and and uh, like I said, I wish I had more time, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, anybody, anybody know, here's just, a very short illustrative example that might convince you that it is worth your time to care. Uh, anybody have a guess of how much we spent on just forget the states, just federal marketplace, healthcare.gov through now, through the end of the year? 300 million, 2 billion. Yeah, like this, it's really hard to pin down, depends on what you include in that price, but 300 million, it's definitely at least that much, and it could be as much as 2 billion. Um, we were working with a number of about 700 million, 700 to 800 million uh, was my best guess, and I heard some new information just last week which said that it's probably well into 1.5 billion. Certainly, if you include all the states, we're now measured well into the billions of dollars uh, to build the healthcare exchanges. Um, and, and we got 8.1 8 million people enrolled, which as you know is, uh, is from our perspective, a huge success. Uh, a great big home run, way more than we ever thought we would ever get uh, in October, November. Um, by way of comparison, uh, Twitter, I looked this up last night. Somebody, somebody else, not me, I think it was Todd Park has a slide where he has detailed all of this stuff out uh, and he did a much better job of researching it and I don't have that slide so I just uh, looked this up last night. Uh, Twitter uh, got its first three rounds of funding, took it through 12 approximately, 12 to 15 million active users on Twitter. Uh, the sum of the money they got for the first three rounds of funding was about $23 million. Uh, and even in the tech industry, we would look at that and say that's bloated and they are wasting a lot of money. Uh, like that's too much to build a website that ser that serves 23 million people. So, uh, when I'm talking to Silicon Valley audiences and say like, um, here's here's why you should get into this kind of business because if you can either if you technology people can either build a working website that actually serves the needs for a billion dollars, <laughs> or build one that doesn't work and totally fails for merely 100 million or 200 million or so, if you can do either of those things, then the government is coming out way ahead uh, by hiring you. Uh, so that's, you know. <clears throat> so those are the, so I, I made up the checklist. Uh, please go ahead and have a look at it. If there aren't enough at your table, I got more copies up here. Um, I, I do think, and I ran this by a bunch of the other engineers, I didn't get it approved by Google or anybody else, uh, as it clearly says at the top of the list, uh, but I ran this by a bunch of the other people who worked on the ad hoc team. They, feel like it, they, they felt like it was a good place to start uh, as far as if you just want to take a look at a project and figure out whether it's going anywhere or not. Uh, this is the best advice I could give you is the handout right there. So that's what I wanted to write to tell everybody. Uh, I want to talk for just one more minute. I don't know how much of my time I'm over. I'll just use like two more minutes, sorry. Um, the last, I also wanted to say specifically, I don't want to screw this up, so let me check my notes here. Um, I, won't, I won't ask anybody to raise hands because I don't want anybody to feel like they're personally under attack, but there are a few people who represent uh, government agencies uh, around, uh, and there are a few who represent the feds. Uh, and here is the number one thing that I wish I could say to every uh, government agency, having worked with several now, um, every federal agency in particular. In every single case, uh, the leaders of the federal agency have more power than they think they do. Uh, it, there's a dynamic which I see over and over, and we've even seen a little bit in the last couple days, where 
somebody who is fighting the ground fight, which like I said, uh, is, is how I would characterize you know, working at the state and county level, you know, interacting with actual patients, uh, is looking for some kind of help from the federal agency. And from the perspective of the people on the outside, uh, even people in the system who are, other, who are in other places in the bureaucracy, from their perspective, the feds have all the money. They have these giant uh, agencies. They have their pictures taken with the president. They have all the power, right? Uh, and what usually happens when you go and ask somebody who's like, uh, I am the CIO of federal agency XYZ, ABC, PDQ, whatever. Uh, what usually happens when you go to them and say, we need your agency to do something, to, do, to take some kind of action, do some kind of leadership. What's the answer that you usually get? I can't. I don't have the authority. I don't have the power you think I do. Blah, 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 blah. That's, this is why I made the point early on that like everything we did, we had no authority for. Uh, and if we were to do an experiment and had everybody close their eyes and like write down in the name of somebody that they can think of who changed the world in a meaningful way that means something to you, uh, I would bet that very few people would write down somebody who was a budget director or like a staffing director. Uh, which is who the government, which is who the agencies think has all the power, right? That's not usually, that's never the case. Here's the thing that's happened a lot of times. This is why the last thing I wrote on a little paper there is if anybody blames the uh, procurement regulations for their bad decisions, uh, they, they, need to, they need to rethink that position. Because uh, when we heard that uh, on healthcare.gov at CMS and HHS, uh, we, this is a very unusual circumstance, I realize, and it can't be replicated everywhere, but we had a direct line to OMB and to Jeff Science and to everybody there, uh, and we could just go to them and say, look, CMS says they can't buy X because of the regulations, blah, what's the problem? Uh, and what do you think OMB said 100% of the time? Yes, they can. Uh, there, what's wrong with you? Yes, you can do that. It's on like page 974, subparagraph B of the FAR. Like, why did you not know that? Like, that's the reaction from OMB every, so far in my experience, 100% of the time. And we expect with the other projects we're doing uh, slightly less than 100% of the time, but a lot of the time that's the, act that's the actual answer. There is a huge amount of learned helplessness uh, and the government is like a perfect machine for training people to feel like they're helpless. Uh, and <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> people, are, people appreciate that, I guess. Uh, so at least, if you are a Fed, if you are a government leader, if you are something, at least in the cases where everybody wants the same thing, such as healthcare.gov, there was not anybody who wanted the site to not work. Uh, I mean, not working on it anyway. There are lots of people who wanted the site to not work. Uh, but I didn't see them in the project. Uh, Everybody there wanted the same outcome. They did not need authority. They did not need anybody to issue orders. They needed somebody to coordinate and like offer some kind of leadership. And don't, I mean, don't take my word for it. Look at Todd Park, because uh, several people seem to know who that is. He has no authority to do anything. All this open data stuff is nothing but him going and telling people it's a good idea and you should do this thing. That's it. Uh, it is, it's this, you know, it's not, it's not authority, it's just leadership. And you have more power to do those things than you think you do, uh, uh, at least if you would take advantage of it. So please do if you can. Uh, okay, uh, that's basically it. Um, last thing I would say is uh, since healthcare.gov, uh, I go back and uh, talk about our experiences. Uh, and an amazing thing happens when you, give it, when you talk about this in like Silicon Valley. Um, there is a huge amount of interest out there. There are a ton of engineers working on what, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but what I'll caricature is like Snapchat. Uh, and hopefully you know what that is. It's just a thing where you just take pictures and send them over your phone. There's like a hundred ways to do this already, but this is another one that the world needed for some reason. Uh, and there are, like, there are like thousands of projects like that employing thousands of engineers. And after some years on that, a large number of them want to do something more meaningful. There is a huge appetite to work on the problems that you own. Uh, delivery of healthcare services really resonates with people. When I went back from healthcare.gov, uh, and was at uh, some friend's wedding. I had, the, I had, by this point, acquired the ability to hire more people because I said I can't do any more 17-hour days like I've been doing for three months. Uh, I'm out of gas. You have to bring in more people. So I had the ability to hire more people, and like, I was over... Like, normally, it's very hard to recruit engineers to work on anything because it's incredibly competitive. Uh, everybody's got their choice of a bunch of good jobs, and then nobody wants to listen to your sales pitch. Uh, but I didn't have to do hardly anything. Like, I had more volunteers to go work on healthcare.gov, and this is, like, the worst work environment. It's, like, the worst project. This is, like... 
this is like the entire thing is is the worst you can imagine. Like the work environment is terrible. The uh, the the project is is a disaster. Like it's really hard to get anything done. Like there's nothing that would make it easy to sell this project, and yet I had more people want to work on that than I could possibly accommodate. So I have been collecting. We have a little organization. It's not official in any way, uh, but I have 146 when I looked last night people that have filled out a form, registered interest, that say they want to take leave, go on unpaid leave from their real job, leave their homes, go across the country, and work on something like this if there was an opportunity to do so. So if you're, if you're an agency, uh, if, you're, if you are, have a project like this, and you can create an environment where the engineers will be able to feel like they're making a difference, which is what these questions in the little checklist are about, if you can create that environment, I can bring people that will help you, uh, and uh, and 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 again, I have no official affiliation with anybody, but I do have the ability to get a lot of people on the phone if we need help from uh, from uh, uh, from OMB, if we need help from upstairs, from in the federal government at least. I don't have any connections to any state governments, but if we need help from the federal government at least, uh, they will back us up to some extent. Uh, so thanks. Uh, that's what I came to tell you. Uh, let me turn it over to Umesh. All right, um, so I too uh, uh, will have the same proclamation at the beginning. Uh, Umesh Premieri, I'm an uh, engineer with, uh, um, engineer by trade, uh, uh, do work and represent Google here today. Um, I don't know if that makes me a creative snowflake or not, but it, it, it does something. Um, so <clears throat> what I want to do is kind of build on, on that message a little bit. Um, so we heard 300 million to two billion. I wanted to really kind of emphasize two things today and I'll show you some pictures to kind of hammer home the point. Um, one, I want us to be able to recognize, because we do this every single day at Google, when we're investing in what we call better sameness and when we're investing in actual change. Because there's a huge difference between the two. And we spend a lot of time in the first one in general as people and a lot less time in the second one. Uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit. And then two, we spend a lot of time worrying about our users, worrying in a good way trying to provide our users with the best possible experience across our services. And so when I was talking to Dan and, and, and kind of thinking this through, interoperability looks like something to users. It really does. It really has a look. People know when they see it. They know when they don't see it. They kind of have a hard time potentially pinning their finger on it at times. But I wanted to talk about that from a user's perspective to us at Google, what that looks like. So I'm going to start off um, by talking about ice. Yeah, ice in your cups, that kind of ice. Um, so in the early kind of uh, 1800s, there, ice was a luxury to most people around the world. And the way that people actually got their ice was like this, like these pictures, right? People cut, um, went out onto frozen lakes, frozen waterways, cut the ice, had it float down the waterway, and actually uh, then shipped it around the world. So people could ship like 200 tons of ice, and it was, wasn't atypical for about 80% of that or 60% or some large number to melt in transit. Um, so that's kind of how it was done back then. Within about 30 to 40 years, those people were completely irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. Why? Because there were mechanical ice makers, right? So people simply, companies went and set up shop on the banks of some uh, river near some city, produced ice, and, tr uh, and made that available to people within a, sort of a certain geographic distance uh, relative to that location. So all fine and good. Within about another 50 years, those people were completely irrelevant. Why? Because we all know what this thing is now. We all have refrigerators. Um, so why is that, right? What, why seemingly very, very smart people, right? These are ice harvesters, very smart people. Why were they deemed irrelevant as a group. There's sort of two reasons, as it turns out. One, if you look at it from, and I don't mean these as technical terms, from the producer side, those who produce ice, they knew sameness. When they invested, they knew to invest in better saws, better shipping methods, better techniques to do the same thing that they'd always done. They realized that from a user perspective, cost and convenience are what mattered, but they had, they had no idea that continuing to invest in the same thing was ultimately going to lead to their irrelevance. What about the mechanical ice makers, right? So they picked up on the cost and convenience part, without a doubt. They got that right. But why didn't they sort of 
pick up on the emerging trend with refrigerators, right? So seemingly, logic would dictate if it's good to have an ice maker near a city and get it to people, then having one in your house would be a, would be a better thing. Well, they had a separate problem. Their problem was they had a massive, dare I say, legacy infrastructure they had, had to figure out how to support. So investing in better sameness is a really dangerous thing especially for us and, and folks like Mike and myself every day who think about, from a technology perspective, how we, how we serve our users. We, we often say at Google, right, incrementalism absolutely leads to irrelevance over time. So I start with that really to kind of get into what I really wanted to talk about, which is who's really driving that next progression, right? Who's really driving the demand for us to not invest in better sameness? It's our users. It's your users, it's our users. And, and, I, and I put it that way because, yes, we have hundreds of millions of users every day across Google properties, and we have a general understanding of what they do across our services. But the reality is those users are your users. Your users are our users, right? We tend to have this perspective that there's two personas for people, what they do in their personal lives and what they do in their work lives. But the way that they actually find and use information, it's exactly the same. There's no difference between it whatsoever, and, and anyone who, who, who wants to debate that, I think it's, it's a healthy debate. But there is no difference, and we have to break down that wall. And the reason I bring that up is because the way people interact with their information, it's obvious, has dramatically changed in the last few years. And so I'm going to try to simplify that. I'm going to try to very much simplify that today as to what do we see in aggregate, certainly across Google services, for what people want, how they interact for information, and what we're trying to do to help them with that. So I'm going to make it really, really simple in terms of you know, what do users want? What do they want to do? They want to ask questions. That's it. You say, OK, I wish that's common sense. Got it. They want to ask questions. What do we need to do? We need to give them an answer. Again, common sense. Got it. Um, but here's the trick. Do we know what they're going to ask? Do we have the first idea what billions of people around the world are going to ask every day? To put that in context, right? If you think everyone here, I'm sure everyone uses Google search, familiar with it, it's a nice little tool. 15% um, of everything that's been put into Google.com every day has never been put there before. 15%. What do those people expect? Either an answer or bread comes to an answer, right? So let me quickly talk about three types of questions that I think really, really summarizes what users are doing today with IT systems. Yep, we can have a, a conversation about the way to build those systems and all those good things, but I want to give you a perspective because users are users, and that's what's driving this next level, of, uh, next level of change. So the first thing that people are really focused on is facts. This is the largest, um, largest grouping of questions, and I use the term questions very loosely right now, that we see every single day. So people do this all the time. You go to a search bar, you put in Barack Obama. It doesn't really sound like a question, but I assure you it's a question. Right? People don't just put in terms for the sake of putting in terms. They want to know something. Maybe how tall he is, how old he is, when he was elected, what his latest stance on a policy is, whatever the case might be. So what you kind of see here is over on the right side, we don't know what the question is, but people expect an answer to that question around facts. So you see a bunch of stuff. Born, spouse, parents, children, sorry for those in the back, that's a little hard to read. So what is that, right? That's us understanding in aggregate what people are generally looking for as far as information. So when they put in Barack Obama, there's certain facts around Barack Obama that in aggregate are what people generally tend to be looking for. Breadcrumbs, don't know the question, we want to try to provide them the answer to this. Does Google own all that data? No. Does that sit somewhere out in the internet? Yes. Right? What does interoperability start to look like to people? Right? Kind of looks like it's being served by Google. OK, that's all fine and good. But if we get past that, what people really want to do is what's in this next one. They want to ask the actual question. How tall is Barack Obama? What school does this child go to? Um, when's the last time food was delivered to this particular location? These are real questions, right? Real questions that deserve real answers every single day. So now, as you see, there's a difference here. It's not, about, it's not about Google search. It's about what users want. They want an answer to the question. So here, six foot one. As a side, everyone's always amazed that Putin's five foot seven. That usually comes up in that, uh, in that discussion. <laughs> so I'll just save you, the, uh, <laughs> save you the need to raise your hand on that one. Um, it is right, so, uh, um, but it, it, it's, it's an answer to a question, right? 
But it goes beyond this. It's not just about answering questions and facts about those questions. What do we as humans do? We're, we, we inherently like to reason, we like to investigate. So we need to go beyond that in terms of what we give our users. So if you see here, now we can ask, how old is he? Again, don't make it about Google search. Make it about the way we're actually investigating to try to find information on behalf of our users, information that doesn't live with us, information that lives anywhere that it wants to live. So we've asked, how tall, uh, how tall is he? How old is he? And now we can start a line of questioning and reasoning, reasoning around a, a, a topic and a subject. So we at Google spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to solve this problem really around facts. We have over 600 million entities we track today and billions upon billions, 20 some odd billion facts that we track. But the future of where we're going, and I would argue you can see it here today, is that people want to ask questions about facts every single day. We do it when we're shopping for shoes. We do it when we're looking for anything on the internet today. And we have to make that experience dirt simple for users. Dirt simple. That's what dirt simple really looks like. And again, I would argue this is what interoperability looks like. It's about getting the answer to the question. So the first one I quickly walked through was, was facts. How do we, how do we answer uh, facts? And I'm sure if I were to pull the room right now and I'd say, are there facts about your data today in your environment that you cannot get out? And I don't mean get out in terms of let's go do a, what was it, $300 million systems integration project to go get out the data that you already have. It's really around understanding how users want to interact with that information and then applying some of the principles certainly that, that, that Mikey talked about for how we get to that. And we can, we can talk a little bit more about that. But in the interest of time, let's kind of talk about the second category, really complex questions. So uh, I always use this example, and those of you I've spoken to have, have heard this before. So you know, probably most people in this room have moved, right? Moved, your, moved where you live at some point in time. And if you move and you have kids, you often will, will kind of get into this circumstance. Uh, this happened to us, you know. I have two homes that I'm interested in. Those homes are in school districts. And I want to ask a single question. Which of those homes is in an area where there's a higher density of five-star schools? Yeah, it's not really a fact-based question. I mean, there are facts behind that, but that's a really complicated question if you think about it. Where are the homes? Where are they geographically located? What are the schools that are in that area? What's the rating associated with those schools? Depending on the time you ask, the answer might be different. And that data is owned by a whole host of organizations, right? A whole host of agencies to actually ask the question. So what we typically see is we see this type of thing. And this is actually, um, I'm going to use a little example of the, uh, of the California uh, fires recently because I think it's, it's really relevant to this particular type of question. So what we typically see, and this is on the California State website, is this type of information. We have Hunter's Fire, uh, CAL Fires, the administrative use uh, uh, unit. It's 100% contained. Um, it, it, and it doesn't matter if it was 90% or 100% contained for, for, for this example. Um, but what if we wanted to ask questions of the data? What if I lived near the Hunter's Fire and I wanted to know the best route to evacuate? What if I wanted to know if I really thought the fire was going to get better or worse in the next 24 to 48 hours? Um, what if I wanted to make a prediction about the direction of that fire for my own personal use? How do you answer those questions? Because we believe beyond facts, this is where the questions now are. This is what people want to know. And they want to know it about enterprise data, they want to know it about with information that's out on the internet, public data, and the integration of, of, of those, two, those two types of data. So sure, we can go down a path, and, and there's you know, many companies who can do this, where we can start to, to put things on a map. But let me flip forward real quick to, to, to kind of this view. Right, every single day we receive today, and I think it's a really low number, in the neighborhood of, you know, let's call it a couple of hundred million queries that are this, this type of complexity. That question about school districts, what's the best way to evacuate? And, and think about that. If you just go into a system, whether it's a Google search or anything else, it doesn't matter. If you just go into a system and say, what is the best way for me to evacuate? It's a really hard question to answer, uh, a really hard question to answer. And what we are finding is the way in which you answer that question really has nothing to do with text. 
more and more and more often. And I would argue that couple of hundred million number that we see every single day is only going to go up as we're able to really start answering these questions as a community. So think of the types of questions a caseworker might have, a social worker might have, a medical provider might have that are really related to this level of complexity. Uh, and it's a really, really tricky thing, uh, a really tricky thing to try to get to. But what I really want to show here, and it's, a, and it's a little bit hard to read, is again, don't focus on this as a particular solution, but it's kind of to back up uh, Mikey's point on this. If you look on the legend on the right side, air quality data from the EPA, data from the, the, the US Geological Survey, CAL FIRE data from the state of California, um, weather.com, weather.gov, earthquake.usgs.gov data, Waze traffic data, Google traffic data. Does this cost, does this cost a billion dollars to build? No. Does it cost hundreds of millions? No. Does it take a year to put it out? Well, I hope not, right? Because it's kind of a, around a very, very urgent situation. The, the point is interoperability around this set of really complex questions, we really have to think about what that looks like to a user and the right way to answer that question. I could tell you right now, and this is maybe bashing Google even a little bit, if we try to answer that question with a set of blue links in a Google search, that's the wrong way to answer that question. We really have to understand how to provide that information back in context. So increasingly, these, con these contextual questions, it's really important that we understand, whether it be through a map, whether it be on a timeline, the right way to, to answer these questions. But this is a very, very simple example of nine, 10 different organizations, nine, 10 different agencies, being able to have data pulled together very, very rapidly in what I would measure in days or weeks. To, to solve a very, or to assist in a very real problem. And this is happening everywhere, whether it's in 311 and we want to understand the health complaints in New York City uh, and around those health complaints, which ones did the actual police department report to, whether it's around missing children in the state of Iowa and understanding what it looks like or uh, you know, what the incidences are within 150 miles of Waterloo and so uh, Iowa. So I just put these up as very, very quick examples that we really have to understand the difference between fact-based questions and complex questions and understand how to give that information back. And oh, by the way, it gets incredibly, incredibly complicated when that question could be coming from any device on the planet, right? And in your organizations from any type of device, it, it, doesn't, really, it, it doesn't really matter. So the last thing I'll kind of say, which I think is the future of, of where we're going um, and, and where I think it becomes really important, uh, again, from a technology perspective, is that Increasingly, people want to ask contextual questions. How, how many people, you know, kind of um, do this on a regular basis? You see my example up here right now, you know. It's great to be able to pick up your device today and go, what time is my flight? Is that an easy question to answer, right? It's actually a pretty complicated question to answer in the end because who am I, what's my persona, what's it tied to, where's that data, um, what's the way it needs to be presented, what device am I coming back? These are all very, very, very challenging and, and difficult things. But increasingly in computing, in the way we're, we're looking at it, as we progress from fact-based questions to these very complex questions, whether you're a caseworker, a social worker, or just a consumer, what we're really seeing is people want to ask questions about themselves and they want answers about themselves. And so therefore, there has to be context around that person. So there's a huge difference up here between what time is, what is this thing, Virgin Flight 77 versus what time is my flight. And increasingly, as we think about our systems, this is how people will want to receive information. So let me just take you back to this notion of investing in better sameness. Can we evolve our existing systems as they are today to do that? I would argue that much of the data is there, but if we continue down the path of the same types of systems integration projects, the same types of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, to predetermine the questions that a user is going to ask and predetermine the answers we're going to give that user, we're going to be in a whole world of trouble. What we have to plan for is this future where around facts, context, uh, and these complex questions, we don't know what they're going to ask. And we either have to be able to provide that answer directly or provide them the breadcrumbs, uh, the breadcrumbs to that answer. So the last uh, piece that I'll, I'll say is, you know, and we think about this every single day, I would implore you that every decision, every day that, that you're thinking through and that you're making, that you ask yourself sort of this very simple question. Uh, we do it every day. Is it better sameness that we're in investing in? Is it the ice harvesters? Is it the mechanical ice makers? Are we looking at something that as difficult as it may be, 
that we are looking around these fact-based complex and contextual questions to shift direction for how we better serve that user base. So sort of an abbreviated version on my end, but I thank you very much for your time. Questions, questions, questions. Yes, sir. The state of the art. State of the art. <laughs> okay. The state. Of the, the state of the art. Oh, there we are. The state of the art of the Google has achieved so far with you know especially the complex um, contextuality that looks pretty amazing. And how far along are you actually? Um, I suppose reasonable is not probably an acceptable answer. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, just so a little bit of context. We know how many of those every single day that we're seeing and how many of those types of questions. And we know right now that it's early, that it's hard to give those types of answers. And I'll tell you why. Because much of that data is often actually owned by organizations, which is very different to right. It's owned by enterprises. So the example I often give that maybe illustrates the picture is if you go into any of our properties today and you type in something like Chicago crime or Chicago city crime, what you're gonna get back is likely not what you're looking for, right? What you're looking for likely is either owned by the Chicago Police Department or owned by some organization that knows the year over year, month over month rate of change if that happens to be the question that you're asking. So right now, we are actually, I would say, early in the journey to work with organizations for that data, uh, that data that should be made available under op various open data initiatives, to make that data, av those really that map data, that geospatial data available um, through Google, so then it's discoverable in a Google search, and we can start to answer those questions directly. So we're, we're fairly early, but um, if you go out and look at our things like Maps Gallery, you'll start to see you're able to answer some of those questions today. So you said something um, at the very end, and I'd like you to reemphasize the point and not be so diplomatic. Okay. <laughs> what you said was, uh, we have to stop doing integration, right? Yeah. And I want everyone in the audience to think about what that means. Because if you look at the A87 exception, uh, exception uh, tri-agency letter, which you, most of you are probably familiar with, and you look at the list of things that the feds are prepared to fund 9010. It struck me dramatically just a few weeks ago when we were talking in our team that that list is all things that you would do back in the late 80s. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. So, um, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, um, good. So, the point is is it's all focused on integrating structured data. And despite everything that we deal with on a daily basis and what we work on for CIOs that are in the room and other IT people that do this every day, uh, what we're dealing with is primarily structured data, which is only a tiny percentage of what we actually use to make a decision. Because most of our agencies work on paper forms. And in Illinois, um, uh, we spent a huge amount of money in the last two years just doing enterprise content systems, which means that we've scanned social security cards, birth certificates, 12 months of bank records, right? Isn't that what you need to make a decision? To let somebody get a block of cheese or something? All right, so that, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what we do. So I think it's very interesting that you develop more this idea about how enterprise search actually supports decision support. So that's the first question that I have for you. For Mickey, the issue of the website was not the website, the issue was the back end of what we're just discussing right now. It was the challenges of the rules and regulations of the back end. Um, so what insights did you have about the problem with the back end and the rules and regulations which affected the decision making about how the website was developed? Because all 50 states were given hundreds of millions of dollars to the tune of billions of dollars to build an eligibility system. By the time we finish them, those that we had that decided to do it, they'll already be legacy from 10 to 15 years. That's what it'll be in Illinois. That's not a knock on the people working hard to make it work. 
It's just the reality of what happens when you actually do a massive uh, attempt to modernize a system that you probably first deployed when the Bill Cosby show was popular on, on television, right? Which is what we're all, we're all working on. So the interesting point here is, is how do we begin to address this at the federal level so that the decision making and the very dedicated work that's being done at the state level, which is really doing better sameness, changes the paradigm, which is what I think why most of us are here, to change the paradigm on solving those kinds of problems. And back to Ivan's question, he's saying, okay, well, how far ahead of you are you on this technology so that we could even make the argument to decision makers to take the steps that I'm describing here? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk to the first one then and kind of hand it, hand it to you. So I think the thing, um, since you asked me to, what'd you say, to not be so diplomatic, I will not be diplomatic here. Um, so to, to the first point, at some point, we have to trust our users. And I'm just gonna say that. At some point, you have to put some trust in users, right? Uh, it's the mantra we live by. I was with a state that I, that I won't name, and uh, we were looking at their architecture and looking at what they're planning to build. We said, what's the information you need to make a decision? Well, it's these 15 fields. So we're gonna build a form that gets those 15 fields of information and only those 15 fields of information. It's the wrong answer. It's not trusting your users. It's trying to control your users, right? That's the difference in the paradigm, and, and it's, a, it's a perfect point that, that you've made, is that as we look forward, right, so yes, the technology's out there, we're starting to see some progress, but if culturally we cannot get to the point where we start trusting our users to interact with information find information and then make decisions based on that, we're gonna be investing in better sameness for a very, very long time. So that's how I would kind of respond to that first piece. Sure, so uh, I'll, I'll interpret the question as um, all of the backend processing rules, all the integration across multiple agencies was way too complicated and that this really undermined the likelihood of success of implementing something like healthcare.gov, right? Um, and I, I still failed to put it in the form of a question. That's just kind of an assertion, uh, which, which certainly, uh, absolutely it was. I mean, the, there's the thing called the Data Services Hub, and it had to, uh, court, had to, uh, to finish your own insurance application. It had to communicate with something like 26 other agencies, uh, and all of those 26 other agencies' online systems were built to the same standards of uh, availability and reliability as healthcare.gov was. Uh, so uh, I'm glad Umesh went first because I'm basically going to steal his answer, which is uh, um, this is a this is everything about healthcare.gov was a classic was another textbook case of all of this stuff was designed for what the agency perceived its needs were, not for what the actual user trying to use the site cared about. So that meant that there was stuff like your application process would include some screen where like it went to talk to 20 different agencies and like it told you like now contacting Department of Homeland Security, now you wait for that to happen. Now contacting IRS and you wait for that to happen. The user doesn't care about any of that. Uh, the only the agency cares about that, and as far as I can tell, the only reason to even have that screen in the UI is so you can blame somebody else when it's slow, right? <laughs> <coughs> like, this is, this is a total waste. Like, to implement all that stuff was a total waste. The user does not care. Um, so that's why, like, one of the questions on the thing, and one of the, uh, um, this checklist, by the way, uh, is kind of sort of derived from something called the Digital Services Playbook, which OMB is supposed to be releasing and is supposed to be enforcing uh, relatively soon, but isn't, like, cleared for release yet. Um, so that's why one of the first things on there is design for the user, uh, uh, not, it, it is not, not, not for what the agency feels its needs are. Now that's hard. Uh, I don't have, like, I mean, if, 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 we, if we escalate the problem statement to be that the U.S. government is too complicated, like, I can't fix that problem, right? Like, it, it, it definitely is. Uh, that's what happens when it goes 250 years without ever being rewritten, right? Like, this is a... <laughs> This is the same as like software systems have the same problem. Uh, so like uh, the only thing I can say that's constructive about that is yeah, it's too complicated, but what I have found so far is that without touching a line of regulation, without, without touching a, a legislative solution at all, you can still do way more than most people think you can. A huge amount of the problem is just fear and uncertainty and doubt and so on. Uh, so, so far, I mean, we were able to get 
I mean, for all the justifiable criticisms of the law being too complicated, the, the Affordable Care Act being too complicated, we were still able to kind of by brute force get eight million people through the thing and enrolled if we could just get the technology to sort of work most of the time. Uh, and I see huge opportunities for that all across government and healthcare right now. Either one of those is like the topic for weeks long conferences, right? Uh, government is a mess and healthcare is a mess technology wise. And just by improving the technology without touching the regulations, you can go a long way. Uh, so that would be, that, that's, that's at least what I'm focused on in the moment. Uh, and also on, rather than trying to boil the ocean, on how can I make this particular problem better. Um, there will, it will always be possible to escalate from the problem you're looking at right now to an unsolvable problem, such as, you know, the, the US government is too complicated. Yes, it is. I don't know.